Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is MG The Future. Thank you for joining me tonight. Back in my day, I used to call these Midnight Lives. And basically, I take the opportunity just to do stuff and document it. Kind of how like, you know, people stream video games. I used to stream beat making. <laughs> I haven't tried OBS Studio yet to do this live um, on this system. Because I do have something called Loop Back that allow me to route my audio. And the type of sound card I have doesn't have a extra line in to really loop properly. And plus the uh, console for the mixer isn't that advanced. So until I get an Apollo, I'm going to use Loopback or something. I don't know. It should work. I'm going to use it one day. But for now, we're going to do a good old handy screen capture. This particular project I did in like two minutes. Um, and the whole point of it was to get melodic flow to work on this system within Studio One. Don't think I've ever done it. So it does work and it came out pretty good. Really interesting. Most of these I don't save. I don't care that much about them. Um, because what happens, especially after doing this for a very long time, you can just make anything you want. And most of the times you don't, <laughs> this is a catch 22. But what I mean is when I was younger, I'd finish everything and I have these folders full of beats. I guess I'll show you so much easier to show you guys. So I just have like folders full of beats of just like everything I created within a month. I just save and, you know, some stuff I'm proud of, some stuff eh, didn't need to be saved. And then I guess sometime within the last two years or so, I've done a lot less, but I've actually been creating more, but finishing less. So like January was decent. You know what I'm saying? That's the FL Studio about. FL Studio helps me a whole lot because it's quick to arrange. So that's why I finished so many more. And then, you know, even with my Ableton Live stint, I was doing decent. And then last month, June, May, I messed up somewhere. May was lit. Most of this is tutorial stuff, though. In June, when I switched computers, only two of them were finished. And I think I accidentally put a lot of June stuff in May. I don't know what happened here. Or they're in my documents folder for Studio One and the old computer. I just didn't care. And then July, here I am. This is a little bit better. A lot of tutorial stuff, but I'm picking back up, you know, just my frequency of creating. Um, and my personal goal to myself, so I don't waste it, I don't waste my DistroKid, because I have a Premiere profile in DistroKid or preferred artist, or I don't know what it's called, but basically I can upload something today and it'll be on all distribution today. It's a really cool feature and I appreciate them for that. But um, I haven't, really been inspired to do anything grand wah. Like there's not, the difference between a kid and now is that when I was a kid, I had something to prove. I had, I had to prove that I was getting better. I had to prove that I was good as someone. I had to build my confidence and esteem as a producer. And I actually had the most confidence and esteem as a person back then. Now it's kind of flip flop. I have plenty of confidence and esteem in myself and my knowledge and my tool set. But I just seem to be lacking inspiration overall to create something or to impact people, you know, outside of my normal stuff. I don't have this voice that needs to be heard. And I think that might be problematic because I already have a voice on this particular platform. So I'm not greedy that way. I don't need but so much attention kind of thing. But I do have an, a nagging that I should be doing more. So I'm going to resolve this somehow, whether just psyching myself out, tricking myself, uh, thinking about doing another sample pack for you guys. Like that stuff is weird. Like when I do a sample pack or something, I switch into a different mind state. It's kind of weird. Like I create all these chord progressions and loops and drums and sounds and do all this cool stuff for someone else. But when it's time to do it by myself in one whole project, like one beat, it's just my brain just does something weird. So I'm going to try to psych myself out. Um, a lot of you have trouble getting started. 
I no longer have that problem. <laughs> I used to. Um, especially with samples and stuff. Maybe I'll listen to a sample. I haven't done that in a while. But I have tons of old samples from that old hard drive. Um, and what I'll do is I'll listen through these. And what I listen for in samples, especially these since they're pre-cut, um, I listen for what I can get out of them. Like technically I could loop that and add drums. <laughs> Ain't no shame in my game. Used to do that all through 2005. I find the dopest samples, filter out the bass, and add drums. Change the tempo, time stretch. That's when time stretch was an infant on software. And I'd be able to take things and put it at any tempo I wanted. But now I listen for things I can extract, things I can separate, whether that's with regroover, melodyne, extract stems even. Sometimes I try to take the voice out of stuff. Um, but I just listen, really. And I think that's half the problem. I've listened to so much music, if as you can imagine, um, not just our genres, but old stuff, sample stuff. And then I, I kind of, in my brain, it all sounds the same. Or a lot of it sounds similar. That's crazy. So I'll take something like that, right? That sounds really good, actually. And once I know I can separate something or isolate something, I start to think about what am I making? So back in the day, of course, I loaded up some East Coast drums, my fake Kanye West kits, my croup drums, and things like that. Um, today is a little bit more difficult because people don't rap that way no more. Um, that kind of music doesn't excite as much. And if I'm playing the game of increasing my chances of being discovered or increasing my chances of having feedback from an artist, I would want to make what's contemporary. So my brain automatically listens to this instead of going through the Alchemist Kanye Just Blaze filter. Now I'm doing it the Atlanta filter. <laughs> And since I know these guys are sampling more, um, it's kind of easier because I don't need so much of the sample no more. They normally use one bar. So it'll loop just like this first part. It'll just be that whole beat. And that sounds all right. But I need all that. And another thing, <laughs> this sample is a uh, <laughs> brother cut it off way too short. Oh, God. <laughs> another reason why I don't use this as much. So this will go all the way out here. So what I need to do is find the tempo and lock it in. I think it's like this, right? Let's find it. So that's the downbeat. I need to get that to the two. Fifty nine, yeesh. So it's like one twenty. And because he cut it too short, <laughs> I can't even loop it. Lord have mercy. So I would do it like this, right, or something, and then just to make sure it loops, like bong bong, hit it to the top. And I have little tricks I learned along the way. Like, I really want to fix this time stretch. Like, if I quantize it, though, it's going to mess up my pitch. Yeah. And I, I'm quick to get frustrated. I'm, I'm quick to delete this. Like, yo, <laughs> it just ain't working. Because that snare is going to mess up my snare, of course. And this is just tilted off a little bit. Um, But I'll keep going. I need to slice it here with the razor. And I'm going to A-B it like I've got good sense to do. And loop it evenly.
And that's problematic. I'm going to try to bounce it, though. So I get that extra piece at the end. And then I'm going to Melodyne it. And Melodyne is going to tell me the baseline more than anything else. In the key. If I can remember how to do that. It looks different lately. I think there's a zoom or something. It's not that one. Is it here? Boom, it's in B minor. So I'll go ahead and set key at the bottom here, put that in B minor, get half the headache out the way. It starts on the E, or no, it starts on the B. So B to E, skip one, no. Go down to E, skip one, skip one. It's actually an E chord. It looks like, yeah, it looks like it's an E chord, but the B, the bass is inverted, or the root's inverted. And also all this stuff is off tempo, so you can't add other instruments to it. So we gotta pitch it. Try it again though. So, there's only but so much I can use from this. This little melodic line here is what I'm worried about. The chords and stuff, I really don't care. I think it's an E chord. And I'll try to finagle that. I want to see what chord track says. And since it's looping twice, it should be easier. So E, F sharp, G. E, F sharp, G, and that at the end. B. C sharp D. So it's just a passing note here. I don't think those are actual chords. And that's a lot of stuff I gotta negotiate in my mind and fix. First things first, drag it down. Whoa. It's all of. I'm not even worried about it. I need to find a lightweight sound just as a placeholder. And the reason why I do this is because I'm not. I'm going to try to use the MIDI from it too. Or I at least have to trace it. And when you drag out a Melodyne, you just get the MIDI. And then I could trace the bass line. And yeah, it just looks weird now. Boom, boom, boom. Where's that? I need that. And then catch my. It's useless. Now I can speed it up too, by the way. Because once I bounced it, it did something to it where it stays between the same four bars. And that that uh, snare is washed. And that's one of the things that are uh, really good about Ableton's warp markers. You have better control of that. The time stretch should be sound, though. Chill. Yeah, it gets weird because what you would naturally do is quantize this on 16s and apply it. Hmm. I just don't know. I don't know if it's worth it, to be honest. I can remove Melodyne. I could then quantize it. The problem with that is it lost its tuning. Low key trash. So there's a lot of mental gymnastics you have to do to make sure this stuff is perfect. And this is probably half the reason why I don't use this workflow as much as I could and should and know how to do, meaning starting with a sample. Because it sounds great. When you pull it off, it's perfect. I want to bounce it, though, to a new track so I can get uh, the ability to time stretch it, too. Who cares if it was clipping? You 
bugging. Then quantize it. It does something trash at the end. It lost its beat right here. I thought I knew how to do warp markers in this. I don't. Why is it just the end though? That's trash. I'm not even gonna go through all that. I'm gonna stick to my guns. Stop trying to do the most. And then just keep the, <laughs> the one bar like I said all this music is. You see all that time I wasted? That's what I'm talking about. Because half the time is figuring out something and making something work, not the creative part. I already hear the rest of this beat, if I can do it right, right? Like that part is the given. It's these little nuances every DAW does different. And that's what a lot of people ask me, what's your favorite DAW? Well, to be honest, none of them do everything I need to do. Because I need warp markers for that, and I need better uh, time stretch for that. I could go into a Serato sample, but then Serato sample... Because the time signature of this is goofy, I can't do the Melodyne step. Or I'd have to use Serato, bounce it, then do the Melodyne step, and still potentially have the same problem. Like, all that's curated or cured by uh, Ableton. However, Ableton doesn't do this. <laughs> or at least not that way. Got counter losses. So now, I need to affect this in a way to make it usable. Because I can't use it like that. Really simple stuff. It's not really math or nothing. Nothing crazy. Okay, I rock with it. Um, I'll pull out Omnisphere, pull out the big guns. And I want to emulate that with a virus sound. Memory virus, I believe it's called. I actually like remember this stuff. Yeah. Um. And then, of course, this feature is probably the most important to me. FL Studio does it, but FL Studio doesn't generate the MIDI. So I want to lock it to B minor. We found that earlier. I need to find that down, 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 down. That's going to bother me. <laughs> Turn that way down. Hold up, slow down. Right? And that just repeats. This ain't rocket science. Four times.
So it is. What is that? There's this one VST I want to show you guys. I can't show you until September. <laughs> it would have made this easy to figure out what that melody was. Remind me to tell you guys it's September. <laughs> I just realized I had something. And it's not a big deal. It's uh, this thing that uh, Ableton does with the scale lock. There's this plugin that does a, a type of scale lock. Um, that I can lock it to B minor and figure out that with my MIDI controller. All you gotta do is double it up. And I'm just taking my time. Normally I'm speeding through this on tutorials and stuff. But when I work by myself, it's more organic. It's more like letting my brain do the math. All right, this is missing. This goes here. This could be here. How does this sound? And I can hear it in my head. The problem I have with music stuff is that what I hear in my head doesn't correspond to a key on the keyboard. I've never made that bridge yet. This is gonna be a filler instrument. I wanna see if I can figure this thing out. This dun, 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 dun. Yeah. It's in here somewhere, man. And these keys ain't even in scale, so these are drums, not keys. Solo this. And you sit here and loop this until you figure it out, man. has a weird delay on that sound. It's almost tricking me to think I got it. This key on a guitar is uh, being bent. So it's the right key, but to emulate the bend is gonna be a blip. I ain't gonna sweat the technique. I need a more aggressive sound. Come on with these EDM stuff, bro.
<laughs> the other thing I realized is that mixing this would be a nightmare. Let's put a hi-hat loop in it. Save me two seconds of production time. Now when it comes to the drums, I know no matter what, Trap has a very particular pattern in chic at this moment, and I talk about it all the time. Um, so I always start my drums on that pattern, if this is the vein. So it's always this, right? Like this, boom, ah, uh, no. Let me hear it first. <laughs> yeah, it's because this is in halftime. I gotta be careful. It's always that bad. Holy. Velocity is always off, which is one of the problems with Fruity Loops. It does the same thing except for it's 70. Or was 70. And I could follow that hi-hat pattern I got uh, from the loop with my own hi-hat, too. I know it doesn't make sense, but it does. Low-key, it does. It just helps you uh, lock in a certain feel, and then you can augment it and remove it. That's my ghost kick. And I need a way harder snare for this second sample. going to irritate me to death that I can't use this.
And what's cool about the tracing elements, like if you see these steps, it'd be better if you knew the relationship, like one, four, five, or whatever in the actual scale I'm in, if I knew that relationship. But you can copy that in other scales and stuff, and your subconscious will pick it up with time. Like you'll start using those movements. Since it's like a rock guitar type thing, it'd be just wise to do it that way. Sounds like I need pitchmen. I just have to do something different. I have to stop being lazy because normally I stop right there, right? So that's a verse. And this is a fill. Whoa. Yeah. Verse, fill. And there's loop the fill. Sixteen subs. More bouncy than trappish, I know. That's just my style. Now I'm be greedy. Because good enough is not good enough. For me, <laughs> it's technically two chords. I want to try this without the passing notes too. B minor, wherever you are. It's a, what is that? What is this? Why are you hiding it? There's a way to send it to chord track, right? Still not what I need. I can't read that. Boom. E. It's E major. What kind of witchcraft? E to G. Oh. <clears throat> it's not in key. That's why there's an F sharp there. E into F sharp. So it's out of key. And then it comes into key. And the F sharp is needed so you can, your ear knows which scale you're in, which is this one, B minor. Boom, boom, boom. Something like this.
It's much faster though. Way faster. Something like this, something light. Come on. Kinda. It don't feel right. But that's because the inversions are different in the actual uh, track itself. This will get on your nerves, quick. I need four of these, and then the last one's a different chord set. B, C sharp, D. Again, out of key, but it's consistently out of key. It's using the same Pi region. B to C sharp to D. Now, that's just a leap of faith. But it works because D and C sharp are half step away from each other. Same thing that was happening earlier with E and F sharp, um, F sharp and G, I mean. It's because they're half step away from each other. A lot of soul music did this too. You can abuse the circle of fifths if you understand how to switch keys by a step, one single step. You just abuse it, go back and forth. Like when you're MIDI controller, look at two keys that are next to each other but not in the same scale. Or, no, they could just be next to each other, two different scales though. Like a D and D sharp, E and D sharp, or C and C sharp or C and B. You can use those as two different scale points, two different slices, and go and modulate between them. It's a lit when you want to get to that style of music. We'll just Scott Storch it. What? Blind faith. <laughs> so I got to drag that out of easy keys. Because um, it crashes if I put it directly on the instrument. And then put Omnisphere here because Omnisphere is probably a lot better. No, that's not true. The continuity of Omnisphere sounds better when you start layering sounds. Oh, I have too many sounds. Nah. Meh. Maybe. Key. K Y. S Y. Old key. No. no. That ain't it. Maybe. Just too low.
Yeah. <clears throat> so, even still, still have to arrange it. And it's one of those tracks that's difficult to arrange because you can't drop it so much. I guess you could just let the melody ride from the sample. Yeah, you can let that ride. That's an easy arrangement. I arrange it just. I would arrange it just like that. It'd be more like a Wiz Khalifa pop urban arrangement than a trappy trap arrangement. But anyway, tomato tomato pish posh. Doesn't matter because I'm still not going to finish it. But I know how to finish it. And uh, I guess that's just how midnight lives go, man. It's really not teaching nothing. I'm just showing you something. I'm just giving you insight. Does it? No matter how far along you've come, you know. The inspiration part's tricky. And then getting things to work in your favor is trickier. And then depending on what your skill set is musically, because we all have different, you know, charts of things we're really proficient at. Um, it's crazy because <laughs> though my downside is I can't hear none of this by ear, I can actually hear it by ear. Like I, I notice me compared to other people who play by ear, they don't pick sounds very well. And I, I find that to be curious. Or if they're really good at like uh, figuring out the keys or the notes, they're not really good at figuring out the drum part or what context of drums. And then that's always amazing to me. Um, and it's not a good or bad thing. It's just something to pay attention to. Some of these tools that I review would be good for those people. Like the drum one I did yesterday, that'd be excellent. Um, the effects too. A lot of people don't understand the automation stuff no matter how good they do. Because a lot of people came up making beats on keyboards. There was no automation per se. So I skilled or scaled my skills in the other areas, knowing what is what and where can I find it. If I don't know how to do it, what can do it? And you know, this stuff is easy. Like if you're like a, <laughs> who's really good um, composer in music? Stevie J. <laughs> I know that's, that's a word you want to bring up, right? Yeah, Stevie J. I'm sure he can make a beat like this in seconds because he plays guitar and keyboard and stuff like that. And he sampled. So he could probably combine all three of his sets and do this in seconds. But, um, and then write to it. Me, on the other hand, once and if I arrange it, I just give it to the rapper and I move on to the next one. Um, if I wasn't vexed about the second half of this sample or if I was in Ableton, this one would have taken as long. But you see how I brought it back at the end there. You didn't even notice that it was all glitched up. And even though I got this key wrong on this guitar part, it worked, <laughs> I guess, because it's in scale. Um, I'm sure after my ears rest and I listen to it tomorrow, it's going to sound horrible. And I won't find out. I didn't even snap it to be minor or something crazy like that. Whatever. But that's when you go back and you, if you finish your beat, you go back and you fix that. And then we can do chord follow and stuff like that. It'll put it in check if I need to. But yeah, and I guess that's kind of interesting to why I would use Studio One and why I don't go around just co-signing it and recommending it to everyone. Because a lot of you might have the skill set where you didn't need none of these tools. You could have just did that layer by layer eventually or come to your own conclusion on what the melody should be. But because I don't have that ability naturally, I have to see this and then see it this way and then trace it and then hear it out and then have enough sense to know why I can put that in easy keys and then I have enough sense to know, well, Scott Storch would be the best person to play that. 
in an urban style, so it'll be an urban type composition on top of everything that's going on. That's crazy. And I was more amazed that chord track was right. This chord track was correct. It was probably a little bit more correct than Melody. <laughs> more helpful than Melody in this case. That's lit. Uh, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it'll be like a gap. <laughs> it'll be a gap and you're like, yo, I hear three chords. Why don't you know what they are? Or you'll right click and do detect uh, key and it won't know what key it's in because they're leaving the key and they're doing slick stuff. And I'm getting really used to reading this and seeing, you know, the two scales he was using. He was using a, a major and G major. They're modulating between A major and G major, but the key's in B minor. So because of that, um, when I trace this guitar part, I can only pray that that's harmonic, that that's actually in key, because I have no idea. It, it, it may not be. With the chord trace, the B minor keys worked. They snapped appropriately. But those chords at the end where that guitar solo happens is in G. Right here. Yeah, G is in B minor. So we're okay. It overlaps B minor, that part of the song. So I'm okay uh, on paper. But anyway, if I wasn't, if I continued that melody on that E part, for instance, the snap wouldn't have worked for me. So sometimes this workflow will, will, will limit you. You might need two different snaps or something. I don't even know how to do that. Ain't that a trip? I don't even know how to work in two different scales within the software. I don't even think the software would think to do that. Like, why would you want to do that? But um, I, it's just a midnight live, man. I'm just talking, just creating. Um, comments, questions, or concerns, probably not going to answer them. Uh, but I guess the main takeaway is as I started to say earlier, at every level you're going to have different challenges. Um, what you're going to learn and what you're aiming for towards actually isn't making dope beats or getting really good or famous or make a lot of money or sell a lot of beats. It's actually none of that. What you're actually trying to do is figure out how to solve problems. And the better you get at solving problems, the more valuable you valuable you become and then the more valuable you become that's when everything else comes in it's it's problem solving it's someone sending you something like this they send you a sample like yo i need you to flip it and you listen to it it's like i can't really chop it there's bass in it there's drums in it and if i filter it out you know what i mean like you have to know how to even solve that problem how to sample it how to flip it what tempo to put it in right and then someone comes up to you is like yo i need a piano solo over this you're like i don't play piano but they want to pay you for it so you need to know how to solve that problem. Or, like I was saying, the new music's in a different tempo, you know, 120 to 140 to 150, instead of 80 and 90. This is typically a sample for 88, 92 beats per minute beat, but I had it sold way down to 66, which is weird that that original song is 66 beats per minute. I don't even like that, hold up. Everything but my hi-hats are gonna work. I take 69 over 66 any day. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> problem solving. It sounds better faster too. So yeah, man, you're going to find out that a lot of production, a lot of stuff I'm teaching you guys is problem solving. I'm not actually teaching you creativity. I'm not teaching you how to make something. I'm teaching you how to approach things and think about things to solve problems. And that's one of my greatest gifts um, in a lot of different areas. And I hope that you guys find that useful and beneficial to your journey when you do discover your own sound, your own tendencies, and your own solutions is what really this all is. And as you get better at solving problems and having solutions, everything else is going to come. You know, the people reaching out to you and hearing about your work, and it's going to show through the actual creativity and music. 
because the more of that Rolodex or Wikipedia you have, the more it bleeds through everything else that you do in your graphics and your paragraphs and what you choose to respond to and engage. It, it transforms your whole um, sphere of influence. So for me, music was my therapy, my gateway, because it was technical and I was thinking and I was, I approached it the wrong way. I'm not your classical uh, uh, story. I'm not your classical, you know, um, type of producer who, who makes it. I, I don't fit those archetypes, you know. They, they just are just naturally gifted in some areas or they find something that works and sticks to it. I get past that and go to different problems to solve and push those limits. And then I get tired of it. And then that's where my beat block comes from is that if it's not nothing to solve or there's no trouble, I don't like it anymore. Or not not like it, but I'm addicted to solving problems and not addicted to creating. There we go. So I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll create a problem and solve it through creation. I just got to psych myself out. Until next time, guys. Peace.